is about reactive guarding scheme uh, by Jasper Nielsen and Samuel Lanichelli. And Samuel will give a talk. Yes, uh, thank you very much for uh, staying for the last talk. Uh, and um, this is joint work with Jesper Nielsen, and I'm going to talk about reactive gobbling schemes. So in this uh, uh, presentation, I'm, I'm going to talk about our result. And our result is we, three main things. is First, we define reactive gobbling schemes. Uh, and then what we can show is that using reactive gobbling schemes, we get reactive two-party computation uh, from reactive gobbling schemes, and it's black pops against a malicious adversary. Now, one thing to note is that previous protocols for 2PC uh, don't actually use gobbling schemes in a black box manner. They actually have to use uh, white box uh, details about the gobbling scheme to actually get security. And then, of course, we have a result that uh, we can construct reactive gobbling schemes in the random oracle model, but for this uh, presentation, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, so what is reactive computation? So first we have, uh, initially we have a state which is just uh, zero. So we have a state and we have a round which will start at round number one. And then at each round, so at round I, um, uh, the first player inputs a function and an input X. Uh, the second player puts in an input Y and then the functionality uh, outputs, has an output Z, and some Z, which is sort of going to be added to the internal state, which it computes from F, X, Y, and the current state. Then it's going to actually update the state for the next round, and then it's going to output both the output value Z and the function to P2. So this is reactive uh, to PC. And so, um, now we're going to talk about what a garbling scheme is, first of all. So we can do a quick recap of what that is. I already assumed some familiarity, so this is just a reminder. Uh, so what do garbling schemes achieve? Well, this comes from basically it's, it, it's saying, okay, we had a construction called Yao's garble circuit, and it achieved something. But this something was never formally specified in the original paper. So Bilari, Huang, and Rogwe came up with a definition of garbling schemes which showed what garble circuits realized. So now the next question which comes to mind is why, uh, why, do we even def why did they define a garbling scheme? Well, there's two principal reasons. So first of all, um, if you have a protocol that uses a primitive in a black box fashion, well, that protocol is more likely to be secure because then you don't have to care about the implementation details under. And the other thing is also you can, because of this, you can easily say, okay, this implementation uh, is better in this case, and this implementation of this pr primitive is better in this case, and then you can choose without having to worry too much about security. So there's many applications of gobbling schemes, secure outsourcing, secure computation, private function evaluation. Uh, there's many more, uh, KDM uh, security, for example, and it's a very important. So uh, just to remind you quickly what a gobbling scheme is. So this is what would be completely insecure protocol for gobbling. So initially, you send a the sender sends a function f to the receiver. And then later on, uh, he sends the input x to the receiver. And the receiver sends uh, the output. Now, um, what we actually want from a gobbling scheme is three properties typically. First of all is correctness, that it gives the right output, but we also either want privacy, which means given the, uh, given the garbling, what we garbled, uh, the, the, the receiver shouldn't learn the function or the input, and then obliviousness uh, hides the function, the input, and the output. So these are properties. Okay. So Global view of gobbling schemes. This is how a gobbling scheme typically works. First, you gobble the function. Uh, this gives you an encoded function, an input encoding string so that you can encode some inputs, and a decoding string which allows you to actually decode an output. And uh, this is the description of function f, and this is the security parameter written in unary. 
So then the next step is you encode the input. So you take the input encoding string, you take an input, and it gives you an encoded output. Then the next step is blind evaluation, where, uh, for example, the second player can take the encoded function and the encoded input and produce the encoded output. And then finally, you can extract the output using the decoding string and the encoded output. So this hides the output, this hides the input, and this hides the function. So, so why did we define reactive garbling scheme? Well, there's certain things that reactive garbling schemes can't do. First of all, as you saw in the previous diagram, there's no partial input and output defined. And sometimes it's useful, for example, in secure outsourcing to be able to provide partial input. Uh, you can't assemble garbled functions together, so you might want to garble one function and then another and decide, oh, I want to apply F and then G or vice versa. For example, in signal processing, you, you might want to do a certain amount of operations in certain orders depending on the data. And uh, you can't do black box constructions of two PC from g garbling schemes. Um, um, this is something that was one of the original goals that Rockway wanted to do, that we build things black box from garbling schemes, but we can't. There are certain details that, something that was missing, and reactive garbling schemes give that. And then uh, we also want to reuse encoded outputs, so we can get an encoded output and then feed it into another garbled function. So this is what reactive garbling schemes allow us to do, that garbling schemes don't can't. So, so how do we actually get a reactive garbling scheme? So basically what we do is we take garbling scheme and sort of expand the definition. So we're gonna do a couple of things. First of all, we'll vectorize. So this means that instead of having one input, we'll have a vector of inputs. And the same thing for outputs, we'll have a vector of outputs. Uh, then we'll have output encoding strings, so ways that we can uh, say how outputs are actually encoded. And this w will allow us to do things. Uh, then we have tags, which is, we need a way of saying which functions we garble and what they garble to. So tags are sort of identifiers or names of functions. Then we have to, a linking algorithm, which says how we can combine two garbled functions together, link them together. And then, of course, we need a new notion of security f uh, called confidentiality, which is, yeah. So vectorizing garbling schemes is very simple. So instead of having a sim encoding a symbol input, you, you can encode a vector of inputs. So you have an encoding for each of the values, and then you have decoding for output. So you can uh, decode partial outputs, you can encode partial outputs, so you, for, yeah. And uh, decode, so basically everything is vectorized, so you can decode partial input, decode partial output, you don't need to wait till everything is defined. Um, yeah, so the evaluation takes partial input, partial encoded input, and partial and extract and gets out partial encoded output. So, what's an output encoding string? Well, it just maps an output value to an encoded output. So it's very similar to the input encoding, and it's going to be useful to link two garblings. Um, so. This is one of the key things in a reactive garbling scheme is a linking algorithm. So what it does is it takes the output encoding string of one function and the input encoding string of another function. So this is like the function we're converting the output and this is the one we're sort of linking in. And basically it gives us something called the linking information, which basically what it allows us to do is takes an encoded output and to convert it into an encoded input for another uh, garbled function. Um, so then, of course, to describe which functions, so we know, oh, we're garbling this function, and when we're linking this function to this other function, well, we added tags. And so, so the garbling scheme takes an additional parameter, which is a tag, which sort of names the, the function. Now the garbled function has a tag, the input encodings have tags, and the same thing for the encoding, and then th in addition, there's a linking algorithm. So the linking algorithm takes an output encoding string. So this is saying how this an output, how the output of a function is encoded, and takes the input encoded of another function and then links them together. So now you can take the encoded output of one function and turn it into the encoded input for another function. 
scrubble function. So then we have the evaluation procedure. It takes a set of garbled functions, a set of garbled inputs, and a set of linking information, and then based on that, it actually just computes the encoded output. So th the definitions are fa fairly uh, simple extension of garbling schemes. Uh, and then, uh, b because, so obliviousness and privacy stay the same, so you basically either hide the function and or the output, or you just hide the function and the input, but then you have to worry about confidentiality. We extend it basically some, uh, so some outputs that are encoded, you can only learn what their value is if you have a decoding for that partial in output. And this allows us, and uh, this notion of confidentiality is actually, a, uh, implies both obliviousness and privacy. Because if you have no decoding, uh, information whatsoever, then you're back to obliviousness. And if you have all the decoding information, then you get back privacy. So this implies this and this. So for example, just to see how it kind of looks like, well, you could garble F and garble G. So just, you end up with two garblings. Then you can link G to F. So this, this is all it's doing. It's basically linking, so it looks really nice. And then you can provide encoded input. And then you, you can decode the output. And it basically, it, it can you end up with something that looks like this. So visually, it's very nice. So uh, what are the applications of reactive governing schemes? Well, you have reactive two-party computation. It's, it's a black box. So it only relies on reactive garbling schemes and not on its implementation. And it's going to use the, the, the watch list. And uh, we also have Lindell's cheater detection. So this was a technique that Lindell uh, used to reduce the number of circuits you need to communicate by having a phase where, where the second player, if he learns that the first player cheated, he's able to extract his input. And we can model this using reactive gobbling schemes. And again, it's in a black box fashion. And then we can also uh, look at mini Lego as a type of reactant gobbling scheme. Because mini Lego sort of, this soldering is actually, in our language, is actually this linking garbled functions together. So I'm going to actually go. Um, in a little bit more detail about how you can realize the reactive two-party computation. So the idea is we're going to have a watch list set up. So the idea is that we're going to have many garbled circuits, and we're going to use half to verify that the first player is acting honestly. So this is basically making sure, OK, he's garbling the right function. And then we're going to use the other half for evaluation. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to evaluate all of them in parallel, and then uh, the second player is going to evaluate them and then take the majority output as the result. Uh, and um, the key is that if, if you, what we need to do is get the majority have the correct output, therefore you get the correct output. Unfortunately, usually there's two security, main security issues that we have to worry about when we're doing uh, two PC protocols. The first one is input consistency of the first player. So one thing that you can have is when you have all these uh, evaluations that are taking place in parallel, but it might be that the, the player P1 who garbled the circuits is sending different inputs to each one. So you need a way to verify that he's using the, sec the same input. And the second thing is the selective failure problem. And this one is the problem that depending on the input of the second player, the protocol might abort or not. And this is a problem that we have to prevent, otherwise it leaks uh, one bit of information. So how we enforce input consistency? Well, we're going to use a special uh, verification function. And the, uh, the verification function, this is for the forcing that the first player uses consistent input, is that the function is going to take uh, the input of the first player, as well as a uh, mask for the first player. This is going to be used to hide his input. And it's going to take a u universal hash function from the second player. And the idea is that this value, if 
the first player tries to use different x and x prime, this value is going to differ between the different evaluations, and the second player is going to be able to abort if the first player uses inconsistent outputs because of this property is that if x is different than x prime, then it's unlikely that the first player chooses an x prime such that this uh, equation holds. So this is sort of going to do this. So how are we going to do this using linking? Well, it's very simple. First, we're just going to garble the verification function. Uh, he's going to send input x and k. The first player is going to send input x and k to the v. This is, of course, going to be encoded. Uh, the, the second player is going to choose g at random and going to send into the function. Now, he's going to get the output, and this is going to ensure that, that if for all the parallel evaluations they're the same, then except with negligible probability, then this he used consistent input. And then we're going to actually link uh, this function to the, go the function we want to evaluate, and this ensures that we end up with an encoded input that's consistent for the sender. And uh, to verify that this is all done, it's going to be enforced by the watch list. So it's, it's very nice imagery. Now, uh, selective failure attacks. Now, this, how do we prevent? So we want to avoid that his, the, uh, whatever or not the uh, P2 aborts depends on his input. So how are we going to do this? Well, the idea is that we're going to garble an identity function. So this is going to, and he's going to, the P2 is actually going to choose a random input. And so this is going to be uh, uncorrelated with his actual input at this stage. So this, this is random. And then what we're going to do is we're going to actually use privacy amplification. So the uh, P2 is actually going to se select a function h such that h of y prime is actually equal to y. So in this way, he's going to uh, use uh, privacy amplification to hide his actual output and so that even if there is an attempt at a selective failure attack, well, the probability that it's going to abort is going to be independent of the receiver's output because we do this. And then, of course, we just link everything together. So then this creates uh, an encoded Y prime, which because of the lim linking uh, gets fed to the hash functions and it gives an encoded output Y. And then this is fed to the functions we actually want to evaluate. So just this linking allows us to prevent uh, selective failure attacks. And both of these things, input consistency and preventing selective failure attacks, have previously been done by using white box modifications. And it's more, most likely that it depends intrinsically on the properties of the garbled circuits. And you have to be careful because depending on your instantiation, it might not work. So this, if you have a reactive garbling scheme, our protocol works. And uh, in summary, we extend garbling schemes. And then we can securely realize reactive 2PC from re reactive garbling schemes in a black box manner, and we actually have an instantiation. Um, uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for staying for the last talk. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. So any questions, comments? So if you had this this notion of reusable garbled circuits, if you added like some linking capability and saving state, that would no. Yeah, pass pass state to the next uh, evaluation. Anyway.
any other comments or question? Um, I have very basic question. Sorry if it is known by everyone. Why do you need to hide a uh, function f? Maybe one more question, come in. Okay, if not, let's thank the email again. <laughs> so that's the end of the session and the conference. Maybe he will have some words, maybe?